This conference will now be recorded. Great. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is really exciting. We actually went to the end of the month this month without having an Ask the Expert, so I almost forgot how to do this. Uh, <laughs> but I'm really <laughs> glad that tonight we have uh, Dr. Catherine Lowen, not Dr. Kevin Barber, whose computer we're using today. <laughs> um, but Dr. Lowen is going to talk a little bit about um, QR malformation, EDS, tethered cord, and different stuff that's affected um, all of our the people in our population, except she's going to talk about it in animals, which is really interesting. And there's a lot of overlap with um, what we can learn in animals to help humans, and what we can learn in humans to actually help animals, which is going to be really cool. Um, but I start every of every one of these meetings asking um, the presenter to talk a little bit about how they got involved, um, why they're interested in Chiari and, rel and related disorders. Um, so I guess I'll just have you do that and then you can go right into your presentation. I'm going to disappear when you do that <laughs> and we can. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I guess just start with why you're interested in Chiari, how you got involved with Bobby Jones CSF and where all this started. Okay. Well, all this started probably about, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, I was a first year surgery resident here at Long Island Veterinary Specialist. Um, and my uh, boss, Dr. Marino, was uh, getting involved in QRI research um, with um, Dorothy Poppy, actually. She brought us a cavalier that she had adopted that she had seen at a pet store. She, she knew the signs of Chiari um, because of her son. And she needed to have an MRI done and she needed a veterinarian to do the anesthesia. So she had called Dr. Marino and asked if he could do the anesthesia, that she could get an MRI done at one of the human hospitals. And he says, Dorothy, I have an MRI, bring the dog here and just took off from there. So uh, we do um, extensive research in Chiari in dogs, clinical dogs. Um, this is a 24 hour hospital. Uh, so it's especially center surgeons, ophthalmologists, neurologists, medicine specialists, critical care. Um, and also we have a 24 hour emergency service. Um, so we've been doing research and we've also been doing uh, surgery cases for several years. Um, and Dr. Marino first got involved uh, through another group and then that involved into the Bobby Jones Chiari and Singer Myelia Foundation. So as being part of the research and one of the surgeons, um, I slowly became more and more involved and then I became involved in the foundation just going to events fundraisers um, educational events and then a couple years ago I was asked to be on the board of directors so now I'm on the board of directors and uh, somehow I became the treasurer <laughs> as well so I'm, I'm highly highly involved um, with the, the foundation um, and hence the reason they asked me to do this lecture um, since we do have carry in animals um, I'm going to start with that um, and then uh, related disorders, uh, as they say in human medicine, so EDS and tethered cord. Um, so the most common, obviously, was talking about Dorothy and her Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. That is the most common breed. Um, probably 90% of the dogs that we see are Cavaliers. They're otherwise pretty much mostly small breed dogs. Um, so you have a Brussels Griffon, they're probably the second most common um, as far as breeds uh, throughout the world. Um, they're less, a little less common in the United States, or at least in this area of the United States. Cavaliers are very common. Uh, we do see Chihuahuas, Pomeranians, Pekingese, Little Yorkies, so mostly small breed dogs. Um, we have had some secondary um, Chiari cases. Um, from other types of like cystic malformations in the brain. Uh, one was a Great Dane um, and the other actually is still here in the hospital. It was a duck culling retriever um, that had Chiari with other types of problem. Um, we've had a few cats that we've diagnosed. We have not done any surgeries, but there are some reported surgery on cats um, that have Chiari malformation as well. Uh, so the symptoms can be extremely variable because it can affect 
multiple areas of the nervous system. So pain is usually one of the, the biggest ones that we hear. Um, the owners are just like, the dog just starts yelping, um, sometimes without even being touched or any reason at all. Or if they just go to even try to touch the dog, sometimes they'll start yelping in pain. Scratching, and this is not necessarily scratching the body. It, it, they do a lot of air scratching. So they actually have their paw away from their body and it almost looks like they're playing an air guitar. Um, it's, it's pretty prominent. Um, ataxia is just basically some wobbliness. Um, so when they're walking, they kind of look like they're drunk. Um, they can also have um, So they, a lot of vets will think that they have, you know, some sort of orthopedic problem, and it turns out it's associated with the nervous system. We do have some animals with seizures, and we do have some with uh, that rub their head. So sometimes they think that these animals have dermatology problems like allergies and stuff, and or maybe that they're playing, but this is a dog who's actually rubbing her head um, on the blanket. This is actually what I sent from one of my clients. So she just feels like there's something on her face. So just like in human medicine, we do MRIs to diagnose this. So, um, you know, dogs walk on four legs. So this is how we read our MRIs. So normally the back of the brain here, the cerebellum should be round. And you can see there's like a little indent here. And then with that indent, then it pushes down on the bottom part of the brain here. And, it, and then it impedes the spinal fluid flow from the brain that's supposed to go down the center around the spinal cord and down the central canal. So the theory is, is that um, when you have this compression and there's also some more um, scar tissue in this area, it's keeping the fluid from going around the cord here and it's going down the normal central canal, which should only be a couple millimeters in dogs. And it's creating this fluid back in here called a searing. So it's ex actually expanding out the spinal cord um, and squishing it within the spinal canal. Um, just like in people, we do start, uh, many uh, veterinarians start with pain management. Um, so there's different types of medications, all very similar to what they use in human medicine. These are all human drugs, uh, amantadine, tramadol, and gabapentin. Um, so we do dose those out for animals. Um, you can also use anti-inflammatory, especially for like these dogs that are air scratching and they're not feeling very good. Um, prednisone is usually the pretty much the go-to anti-inflammatory, that's a steroid, uh, that's for neurologic conditions. But sometimes when uh, referring vets aren't sure what they're seeing, they don't know much about Chiari, they may do a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and um, for animals, Rimadyl is probably the most common for that. So, um, and it has a pain uh, medication as well. So it works for inflammation and pain. So sometimes it's a great go-to if the signs are minimal. Um, in the more advanced cases, when we're talking about syrinx production, um, we, there's a theory to decrease the actual production of the spinal fluid that's being produced in the brain. Um, so their Prilosec is, is actually an over-the-counter. It's called a Miprazole. Um, they do use that in dogs. There hasn't been a whole lot of uh, research that tells you why it works, but it does seem to work in some dogs, and a lot of them have GI issues too, so it works for both. Um, I like to use methazolamide. Um, this is actually a drug our ophthalmologist uses a lot for glaucoma. So again, decreasing the fluid production in the eye is the same type of receptors in the brain. Um, so this particular drug will work for glaucoma and for Chiari. So again, two things in one. In dogs, um, we do have a lot of issues with scar tissue formation. So we had developed, uh, with the help of some doctors at the Chiari Institute, this um, not just doing like a bony decompression at the back of the brain, but also to put in these screws and put in this mesh covering. Because what was happening is we would take all this bone away, clean out this area over the cerebellum, and then scar tissue would fill in and do the same thing that the bone had done. So we started doing this probably about 12 years ago. Uh, we've had a couple hundred dogs that have had this particular surgery and have done quite well with it. Um, and this is a, our CT scanner does 3D reconstruction. So you can actually see where the, this plate and the screws are on the back of the head. 
as I said, we do take this bone down here and we also take some of the bone off the first vertebrae and a little bit off the second. So you can actually see where some of that bone is missing as well. So in the study that we um, are currently uh, working on, 80% of the dogs have an improved quality of life based on owner observations. So we do give the owners a questionnaire to fill out that's telling us what their overall quality of life was before and then after the surgery. And we do follow these dogs out for their lives if we can. Um, also, 50% of those dogs are off medication long term. So even after the surgery, um, they'll be on medication for several months um, so that they're not on any medication at all. I'm sorry, can you just repeat that again? It got kind of warbled. Sorry. <laughs> oh, so the 50% of the dogs um, can be weaned off a of medication after the surgery and won't have to be put back on. So the surgery actually gets them off the medication so they don't have to stay on steroids long term or necessarily pain medication long term. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So that's our Cavalier. Uh, all right. So what? Uh, ehlers danlos syndrome, or EDS, we actually don't see that often, or we probably see it more than we think we do, but we don't um, necessarily uh, uh, diagnose it on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, what we're looking at is animals with really stretchy skin um, and then the inability to heal. So that's usually your first... Um, clue that something's not quite right because dog, dog skin is usually pretty thick. Um, so in animals that ironically spaniel, a different type of spaniel, but English Springer Spaniels are the most common that you'll see it in. Um, you can also have these cute little beagles, German Shepherds. Again, I would never expect that because their skin is usually very thick. Dachshunds, um, unfortunately short-legged dogs always have little problems. Boxers. St. Bernard's, Manchester Terriers, and Welsh Corgis. Those are the breeds, if you do see it, those are the most common ones. And as I said, the, the main characteristic in animals is fragile, loose, and stretchy skin. Um, so here's a dog that you can actually see. Um, they're picking up his skin and how far away it is from his body. So to, there's actually a measurement that you can do based on the on the height from the dog's body of the skin, the length, and um, divide by 100. And then if it's over 19% in a dog or over, excuse me, 14% in a dog and 19% in a cat, then that's uh, diagnostic for uh, EDS. Um, we also see some looseness in joints, um, mostly skin though type of issues where there's um, bruising, Hematomas are basically just like blood clots under the skin. Delayed and poor healing is usually one of the things that we tends to kind of tip us off that maybe something's wrong. So this is a kitten um, who basically keeps getting wounds and cannot, uh, it's not even growing hair in this area because it keeps getting a chronic wound that won't heal. So a lot of times you'll have, you'll have these types of situations and you try to do surgery on them and things just keep falling apart and not, um, and not healing the way they're supposed to. So like I said, if your skin's not intact, you're gonna have infections. Um, if you have loose joints, you're gonna be lame. Uh, unfortunately for pregnant animals, they can have complications with pregnancy and the uterus. Um, there's actually a couple of uh, papers on abnormalities of the eye secondary to again, like you have muscles that uh, control your eye. And so those can be affected as well. Dry fine hair, as you can see on this dog blood vessels that are weak. The cause, so it's an inherited gene, they have found that out, and collagen is, is what makes up pretty much almost everything in your, in your body is some level of collagen. So if you have a gene that is autosomal dominant, it means that a lot of the litter can be affected. So you only need one copy of that gene for a dog to be affected. So if you have a litter, the offspring will have 50% chance of being affected. So do not breed is the bottom line there. Treatment, unfortunately, no available cure. So it's mostly managing wounds, 
um, and talking to the owners about lifestyle modifications. Like this is not a dog that should go tearing through the woods on a regular basis because he's just gonna rip up his skin. So they need to be in a controlled environment, probably limited contact with other animals um, because again, you wanna uh, minimize wounds, make sure they have very comfortable beds, very clean uh, areas where they can be um, housed and, and make sure you're keeping up with the veterinary care um, that they need. Um, you can do surgery on them, but there are higher risks for complications. So you wanna minimize having a wound of any sort if you can. And um, and make sure the owners are aware that you know have a wound. Most owners think, oh, you'll just fix it and and it'll heal fine. But it's not that's that way with EDS because they just don't have the college big conversation with an owner to make sure they understand that this is a life long problem it's not going to just go away and you know they can have a wound that needs surgery multiple times oh and then there is some notations that you can try vitamin c it may help <clears throat> uh tether cord is another one that we don't see very often but i have a feeling we probably see it more than we think we do um it, but it is very hard to diagnose um so actually very recently i had a tether cord um Dog, so I'll talk about her in a few minutes. Donna, please call 306. Donna, please call 306. Sorry, still at work. <laughs> um, so it is rare in animals, but again, it may just be underdiagnosed. Um, so basically, where the spinal cord ends um, and the nerve roots kind of begin, there's a, a, an area called the conus medullaris. So it's kind of like literally the end there. And then there's an, the, the phylum terminale is, is the next thing that comes afterwards. And then the, that gets stretched out and then you have it's basically pulling it so i'll show you an mri so you can kind of see what i'm talking about um so we said abnormal caudal position of this conus abnormal thickening and the inability to be able to, to stretch um on the very short phylum um in animals you can have tether cord secondary to a fatty phylum um, which is what it sounds like, Pat. Um, and neural tube defects. So this is, um, con, you know, congenital malformations. Um, we do see meningoceles. So basically, the cysts that are associated with um, the meninges, which is is the composition of the spinal cord, um, split cord, which basically means the cord comes in two. And um, and actually, very commonly, um, we see dermoid sinuses, and it's very common in dogs called Rhodesian Ridgebacks. So if you've ever seen one of those dogs, they actually have like this stripe down the back um, of hair that goes in a different direction. And they are prone to, to sinuses that go from their skin and that can go all the way down to the spinal cord. And that can happen in the neck and that can happen down in the back near their tail. Symptoms can, uh, can range. Um, the dog that I recently had been dealing with her initial uh, reason for coming in was she couldn't urinate. Um, she would just strain and strain and strain and no urine would come out. Um, she was an intact female uh, German Shepherd. Uh, so one of the things we were concerned about was maybe she was having um, estrogen related um, urinary problems. Uh, so we, in addition to our workup, we did spay her, um, which did help a little bit, but not completely. Um, and then we, we had, the workup we had done included checking for urinary tract infection. Her urine was clear, um, an ultrasound to make sure her bladder was um, the appropriate shape and the appropriate placement. She had a contrast study of her urethra to make sure she didn't have any tears or strictures or any other abnormalities there. Um, and all that came back normal. We also did an MRI, which was read by a radiologist that said was normal. Um, on her exam, she did have a little bit of pain down there at the very end of her spinal cord, which is not unusual for a German Shepherd, but she was one years old, so it was kind of early um, to have any pain down there. There usually is a developmental problem in Shepherds. Um, she did have a weird history of uh, like a hind limb, almost like described as like a, a lameness um, by the owner, uh, where she just kind of like limped a little bit or just kind of held her foot a little differently on, on the right side, but the dog never did it in the hospital and the owner um, 
had a hard time describing it. So this is actually her MRI. Um, so, and again, we look at our MRIs a little differently. So in dogs, the spinal cord ends at L5. Um, dogs have seven vertebrae. So this is seven, this is six, five, and towards the head. And so the cord should end way back here. And you can kind of see like things kind of get extended way back into here, which is abnormal. Um, and this is just a, another type of view of the MRI where the fat um, is uh, taken out of the image. So you can see that the cord keeps extending, extending, extending. And this is like into her tail here. Um, so here, just for comparison, is a normal one, as I said, it usually ends right around five, which is right here. And then the small, and you can see this kind of barely can see it um, in this image here. Um, and basically, in dogs, you have the phylum, and then they kind of go off into the cauda equina, which is, you know, he calls that because it looks like a horse tail. So they have a bunch of nerves that go actually down into their tail because they have a tail, unlike us. Um, and is how the dog wags its tail and moves its tail up and down. Um, one of the reasons why we it was not caught is sometimes you need to do different types of views on the MRI. So normally when we do an MRI of a dog's spine, they're laying on their stomach with their legs extended out behind them. But sometimes to get better images of the tethered cord, you need to, to manipulate, actually change the position of the dog and put their legs forward. Um, so we ended up doing this MRI again on this particular German Shepherd because, as I said, the radiologist uh, originally read this out as normal. So we did these flexed and extended views to get a better view of her tethered cord. Uh, so this, these are uh, pictures from her surgery. So we take the bone away over the end of, this, of the cord here. This is the phylum terminale. Um, so you can see it's very tight as we're trying to pick it up and then it retracts back when it's cut. And that's a picture of her. She's a very, very discreet dog. Um, her recovery actually went pretty well. So all her urinary problems went away, like whatever residual urinary issues she had, that all went away. Um, the pain in her lumbosacral aerial, that went away. Um, the owner, uh, it was during COVID, so she was basically looking at the dog 24 seven. So, you know, she appeared to be walking better, but every once in a while the owner's like, ah, I still think I see it. So I think she just watches the dog a lot <laughs> um, because she was home during that whole uh, quarantine time. Um, but the dog overall is doing very well. Um, so as I said, we have low numbers in veterinary medicine, um, probably due to us not uh, diagnosing it at, at the rate it should be. Um, but most of the dogs do very, very well. So if they only have urinary signs, those almost completely resolve in all the cases and there's definitely improvement in the neurologic signs. Um, so it's just one of those things that as veterinarians, we just need to, you know, if there's a case that seems just a little off and there should be more there to look a little further down at the end of the spinal cord. Okay, do you have any questions or? Hi, okay. So, yes. Thank you, Dr. Moen. Um, I have, I wanted to ask a couple of questions before we get into some of the questions for your talk. And again, if anyone has any questions, I don't think I said this before, uh, you can use the chat function and I can say those aloud. Um, but I wanted to start by like kind of better explaining <laughs> where you work and like how this all this research even comes to be so i know um so you work at a specialty hospital it's private practice um i guess i just to clarify what does that mean do you take care of dogs um in primary care do you do vaccinations or is it specifically like um certain things yeah so we we do not do any general care here um, unless you're a police dog. We have police dog contracts. That's the only general care we do. Uh, otherwise, it is all specialty. So, um, you know, you would go to your, your regular veterinarian for vaccines and, and for little problems, but say your dog um, needed surgery, they would send you to a hospital like this. 
Um, we're also a 24 emergency. So when your event's closed, um, we're always open. Um, and we also take critical cases that, uh, so say needs to be on oxygen or needs to be on fluids 24 hours. Most of the general vets are not open um, in the evenings or overnight. So they will send these cases here for care. And then, um, cause I'm gonna ask you questions about some of the research that you've been doing. Um, but I wanted to just clarify, it's you, it, you don't work at a research hospital. It's pure, purely clinical practice. So they're, they're all people's pets. Yeah. Um, they're, they're coming in sick and you're trying to make them better. So like how do, how do dogs usually end up in your studies? Um, do primary vets know to refer to you or how does that work? Um, the ones in our area, we've done enough lectures to the Long Island um, uh, referring vets that so they kind of know more about it. Um, but there's also a lot of influence on the, on the web. So um, a Chiari Institute, go to um, lives.org um, and go to the hospital website. There's actually a link for the Canine Chiari Institute. Um, so we do get a lot of uh, people who find us through there. If you just type in canine Chiari, it usually comes up. Um, we do lectures. Um, we have in the past done lectures for Cavalier groups and things like that. Uh, so a lot of people will find us through them. We do um, screening MRIs for breeders. Uh, so a lot of breeders will then refer us to, um, you know, people who adopted the dogs if they have problems. Um, and, and people are just nowadays it's also just word of mouth and the internet more than anything um because we do get people from all over the country um that found us online or through some chat room where somebody else had surgery here and they're like no no you have to go to live this they you know they do a lot of surgery um but it is all clinical cases we don't do we don't have research animals or anything like that so we have to be very uh clear with the owners um you know what we're doing and we actually do follow up on these dogs, which a lot of times you don't get in um, other areas. So we do surgery and then we do free MRIs six months, one year and five years later. Um, so we do have a pretty good amount of dogs that come back for the six month and the one. Um, the five years, kind of maybe half of them come back. It just depends. Um, some of these dogs are older and the owners are a little nervous about putting them under anesthesia. Um, but uh, we're very clear when they come here that you know they're getting a discount because the dog's gonna be put in a study. Do you, you guys have a consent form? I know because we're working on some research in-house, so I know I'm working on consent forms. I don't know how that works in animals. Um, yeah, well, because we do a lot of we have residents here, so we do a lot of different research. It's not just Chiari. Um, so sometimes for the study, we'll have a specific consent form, but everyone has to to sign like the three page hospital consent form, um, which is very, a lot of legalese and stuff. But um, yeah, if, if uh, for the specific studies, you know, that the owners are gonna come back and all that, they sign like a general thing for that particular study. Okay. Um, this question came in over the chat and it came in earlier too, but um, symptoms to watch for in dogs. So first of all, is this something that could happen to any animal or any dog or is it specifically something that maybe some of the smaller breed dogs should be a little bit more vigilant about and then how do you i guess especially you said earlier it's quarantine so people are just watching their dogs Sorry. constantly <laughs> uh, what do they look for well it's it, so it is congenital um so these small breeds there are some breeds that are more common than others and so again when you're talking about people who are very very into their dogs who are constantly online in these chat rooms these kinds of things will come up and so a lot of times people think because of the scratching and the head rubbing that this is an allergy and their vet will go down that route so the allergy test the dog ironically they'll put them on steroids for the allergies and the dog will get better because the steroids work for you know, the syrinx and, and can calm down that inflammation. So sometimes it helps, but you can't keep the dog on pred forever. It's, it causes a lot of other side effects. Um, so the, those kind of um, websites, um, anything that we can put out into the, you know, out to the public. So we do have our website that tells you what the signs are and everything. 
Um, so some of the other breeds though, it's their signs are not as specific as the Cavaliers. So sometimes people just come because they need, they know they need an MRI because the dog can't walk. And then we kind of back into that diagnosis um, because we're, it, we're imaging the spine thinking it may have a herniated disc or some other problem. And then we see the back of the skull um, and the compression and the searing sometimes. And then we start looking further up towards the head. Um, this is a good question. Uh, how often is, if at all, hydrocephalus seen in dogs? And if so, is how is it treated? Is it shunted? I know there was a question beforehand that came in. Do dogs? Yeah, I don't. I don't have um, the chat. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so hydrocephalus. Yes, we actually do see hydrocephalus a fair amount as well. Um, and we do most of the cases, um, and it kind of just depends on. Um, you know, if it's obstructive or, or not. Um, some of them, a lot of them can be medically managed, uh, again, with like medications that decrease the fluid production, things like that. We uh, um, use shunts. So uh, same thing they use in people. Though it'll be like a little device that we put into um, the brain where the ventricle is and run it down into the abdomen. Um, so we just have to be careful. Um, we actually did a shunt in that Great Dane that I was telling you guys about. Um, problem is she was a puppy at the time. She was six months old and uh, Great Danes get to be like 150 pounds. So uh, we were actually a little worried we were gonna have to replace her shunt because we thought it might not reach her belly anymore and, and keep draining. But we ended up pretty lucky because we put a little extra in her abdomen <laughs> and then she didn't outgrow it. So, <laughs> um, but normal, normally for animals, those will last the rest of their lives. We usually don't have to worry about replacing them, but they're, they're actually the same shunts that they use in people. We just um, get the, the pediatric ones for the dog. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so you talked about um, having the medical treatment first and I know this is a problem in adult and humans as well so how long do you treat medically before you decide you know um, surgery is probably a good option here most of the cases that are coming here are coming here for surgery so we don't really do a lot of medical management um, because we're getting the referrals um, so some people have tried medicine and it doesn't work um, some people have just gone and, and done enough research um, and just realized that, especially if their dog's young, surgery is the way to go. Um, the only cases I medically manage are usually older dogs. Um, unfortunately, Cavaliers are very prone to heart disease. And so I've had a few dogs that came to see me that were coming for an MRI and then they were in heart failure. Um, so we didn't do the MRI, obviously. Um, so we'll medical, medical manage those dogs, but we don't have a huge um, group of them because that's just um, the, the referral practice. Yeah. Um, a question that came in overnight was humans uh, often see multiple specialists for Chiari symptoms. I know you kind of talked about this with like the Prilosec and how it simultaneously deals with the CSF and also stomach issues. But is it true for dogs too that they see multiple specialists maybe before they undergo surgery or how does that usually go? Um, not, not as much. <laughs> um, so, I mean, most referring veterinarians, like once they know it's something over their head, they'll send to a specialist. Um, but for this type of thing, as I said, sometimes the specialist they see before us is a dermatologist um, who like does a bunch of allergy testing and can't find out why the dog's scratching. Um, so they end up not seeing a ton of different people. Um, and partly because people don't travel as much as far with their dogs as they do for themselves. I mean, we do have people that have come from Florida and California and um, that Great Dane was actually came from California and she still lives there. So they drive her here for the recheck. So it's a little much for some people, Cavaliers and the little dogs you can put on a plane. Um, so they may see a neurologist or mostly neurologists, um, not too many surgeons. Um, like Dr. Bruno and I are one of the few just surgical trained um, surgeons that do this uh, here in the States. Most of them are neurosurgeons or neurologists. Uh, it's a little different in veterinary medicine. Um, a long time ago, neurology and veterinary medicine was mostly just medical neurology. So treating 
seizures and things like that. And then they didn't have a lot of surgical training. So most of the spinal surgeries and the brain surgeries were always done by surgeons. Um, now it's starting to change a little bit, but it's still um, pretty heavy uh, surgeons versus neurologists doing surgery. Yeah. So that changes a little bit too. Um, along the same lines, just as a follow up, about how long after the dogs are seen by you do they end up going through a surgery and going through recovery? Is it like pretty quickly? Yeah. I mean, because usually, as I said, by the time they're coming to see us, they already have a pretty good idea that their dog's probably going to need surgery. So if they don't, sometimes they have an MRI done from somewhere else. Um, and sometimes they don't have a complete MRI because um, and not all MRIs are the same. So we have a three Tesla MRI, which is the best you can get for yourself. Um, but it's the bigger magnet is also quicker and you can do more. So some of these other practices only have like a half Tesla or one five. And so it takes too long to image. So maybe they only image the head and the neck and they don't, they didn't image the whole dog. So we'll repeat the MRI. Um, and, you know, we know ahead of time that they have Chiari and that's what they're coming here for. Sometimes it'll be a Tuesday MRI study um, because we MRI the whole dog and then Wednesday surgery with Dr. Marino and I. Yeah. Um, so they can get in pretty quickly. As far as doing surgeries, we only do them on Wednesdays when we're both here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, talking about MRIs, a, a question in the chat, is phase contrast MRI often or ever used to diagnose Chiari in dogs? Um, we usually don't have to go to contrast. Um, we use our contrast mostly for tumors and things like that. So we just do standard. Um, uh, I mean, we have a whole protocol for the study, um, but for most of our dogs, we do T1s and T2s. Um, and then we do, um, if they have Chiari, we do do fluid um, analysis, uh, fluid studies, um, which Hopefully someday we'll be able to get that research <laughs> evaluated and in, in, in print. But um, all the dogs before surgery and after surgery, uh, so that six month, that one year, and the and the five year, all get um, like Cine MRI, like to to see how the fluid um, changes. Um, do you ever do phase contrast for uh, for like a syringomyelia of some kind? If there's like a tumor or something? If there's a tumor, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's see another question. You kind of touched on this too. Um, some people are given restrictions about lifestyle things before or after surgeries. Um, so a question came in, do dogs have restrictions about what they can or can't do before or after surgery? I know some people take their dogs on hikes, stuff like that. Um, but well, yeah, for Chiari surgery, um, the restriction is three months, no running, no jumping, no playing, no stairs. Um, we did have one dog that um, went up the stairs and fell down the stairs about a month after his surgery and knocked his plate off. Um, so we make it a, a pretty strong three month recovery. Um, and it depends on the breed because they all kind of, ironically breed does make a difference in how quickly you recover too. Like the Cavaliers, uh, most of them, when they come in, they can walk. Uh, most of their signs are related to pain and scratching and maybe some wobbliness. Um, so they tend to do the best because they are, tend to walk right away. Um, right after surgery, most of their issues are pain management until all the inflammation comes down. Um, but some of the other breeds like Yorkies, um, they have a little bit different malformation at the back of their skull. And a lot of times they can't walk at all when they come in and they don't walk right away. So we do have a rehab department that also helps um, with that. So, you know, depending on what surgery we do, um, there are restrictions and we have typed out instructions for owners because, you know, they, you do the discharge and they're so excited to see their pet, they forget 50% of what you said. Yeah. <laughs> even more. Yeah. Um, so you got to write everything down and it tells them specifically, you know, you can't put a leash on their neck. You got to walk them with, you know, in the yard with a harness, you know, what the restrictions are. We recheck them, kind of, you know, keep them monitoring for their restrictions based on the surgery. Yeah, I know. I, so I said this earlier to everyone on the call, Dr. Lowen actually did 
a tooth pull for my dog. So I was like studying the stuff that was printed out because I knew I was going to do it all wrong if I didn't. The biggest um, thing is don't let your dog chew on anything for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're doing. Um, oh, I had a really, I had a different question. Um, uh, so for this, the Chiari surgery itself, is it similar or the same as the Chiari surgery that's done in humans? Is there anything that's done differently? And I guess, does it depend on the breed or? Um, no, not necessarily. So, I mean, in people, we're, we're all doing a bony decompression, um, of, of the back of the, you know, the occipital bone and the, and the top part of C1 there. Um, obviously, you know, we have a little bit more leeway, uh, to make our opening bigger than they do in people. Cause if you make it too big, then, cause we stand up right, then your brain will slouch out. And actually that's where the cranioplasty, the plate came from, from the Chiari Institute, they were using that for um, people who had surgery, who had their, their and they were having that problem. So when we talked to them about our scar tissue problems, they're like, hey, try this. Um, so that works for us. But if you look in the veterinary literature, um, some of them will just do grafts um, of even like, just if you do uh, your own fat and just put it over the cord, like we do this for spinal surgery to keep scar tissue from compressing the cord again. Um, there's different types of coverings that you can put over. So in for us, we don't have to worry about headaches. I mean, if the dog has a headache, we wouldn't know. Um, so we actually leave our dura open um, because we don't have to worry about CSF leaks and things like that. So we don't, we just cut the dura off, clean out underneath the bottom of the cerebellum to make sure there's no connective tissue down there and there's fluid that can flow easily. And then we put the screws in in the plate. Um, so we don't have a lot of the same restrictions as they do in people. Um, you brought, sorry, my dog is dreaming. Uh, <laughs> uh, you brought up a, an interesting point earlier, uh, just now actually a little bit too. Um, obviously the dogs can't report when they're, when they have a headache. And I know you, you talked about this at one of the research meetings and I don't recall exactly, but you had like a pretty detailed um, questionnaire that mm -hmm. uh, I know the pediatric surgeons were also saying like, that's something that they have to worry about too, because the baby can't tell you if it has a headache or <laughs> so. Um, what really goes into that questionnaire and how accurate is it in con confirming if someone's do if one of the dogs is doing well after surgery? Yeah, for animals, it's all quality of life. So if the owner feels like their dog's living their best life, that that's what matters to them. So almost all these dogs will have some level of, you know, residual pain on a physical exam that the owner never knows about. Like I'll note it and there's mild, we call it mild neck guarding. Basically, if you touch the back of the skull, they kind of limp a little bit um, and not even that big of one um, because they're usually pretty well controlled. So the questions are based on, is your dog comfortable? Is your dog able to, to have normal activity? Are there rest long-term restrictions? Is your dog on medications? So things that owners think are the most important, like can I take my dog for a walk and it's not stopping every five seconds to scratch? Um, is the dog yelping in pain all the time? Um, or is this like a happy-go-lucky dog that I can take to the park and, and can live a normal life without restrictions? Um, similarly, have you noticed in any of your research, I know you, you've studied about 100 dogs or more actually at this point, are, are they living longer? Or, or are the, the do dogs that aren't getting treatment for Chiari or Syringomyelia, do they have a decreased life expectancy? How does that usually work? Yeah, so for, um, you know, there's, there's not a ton of research out there, um, but it, the few medical papers that are written about Chiari and dogs, 75% of them will end up having surgery because, you know, the medicine only works for so long. So it, it is a surgical disease in veterinary medicine, even if, if veterinarians aren't all aware of that at, at this point, it still needs more research. Yes, there are gonna be some dogs you're gonna medically manage, you'll never do surgery on for whatever reason. They'll live longer with surgery and most of them will die of something else. So the Cavaliers, most of the Cavaliers that have Chiari surgery, almost all of them will die from heart disease. They get um, a valvular change right around the age of eight, nine, 
and most of them will pass away from that because they've had surgery. They may or may not even be on medication for their for pain anymore. Um, you know, every once in a while, you'll know we'll have die of cancer too. That's another big thing that we see in animals. Um, that's very unrelated. Uh, we've had a couple that were hit by car. You know, <laughs> the normal pet things that can happen. So, um, but one of the things that came out of our study was that m most of them were not put to sleep because of Chiari symptoms. But once you exhaust pain medication and your dog's in pain all the time, then then people will euthanize. That's actually really encouraging. Um, so I did want to ask you about one of the things that you presented at a past meeting uh, with the dural histopathology. So like um, mm -hmm. you noted that there were differences in the cells in the dura, I believe. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pre and post surgery. So I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about that and what that. Um, means. Yeah. So because we don't have to worry about closing the dura and having a tight seal, we actually were biopsying it um, to find out if we could correlate changes in the actual dura to clinical signs, um, which it didn't really pan out exactly as we thought our hypothesis thought. Um, but we did prove that they can get basically you know scar tissue formation and in some of these dogs were going all the way to bone formation it was so the chronic the inflammation was so chronic that they actually were forming bone where they should have had soft tissue so that was kind of interesting because you know when we do the surgery and we cut the dura out like sometimes it's it it's not that easy to pull it out and it should be this really thin um sheet that that should be very easy and these things are very very thick um and and then sometimes the bone over that is also thicker too. So to carefully remove that. Um, so that was kind of interesting to see that there were those types of changes. Um, but uh, we're well, hopefully <laughs> we just resubmitted that paper to the publisher. So hopefully that one will actually be out soon. Uh, question came in the chat that's actually relevant to humans as well. Um, actually, wait before I do that, I wanted to know. Um, how something like that might translate to human medicine. So uh, as far as like bone formation, that that's really interesting. I know on past uh, sessions like this, people have said like, oh, my, I swear I, I like had bone regrowth after my surgery and I had to have another decompression. Is that something that maybe the translation might help try to get that? Well, I, and I think we had this discussion at one of the meetings. Um, because in human medicine, the big question is, do you do a duroplasty or not? Um, so they were kind of interested in what we were finding because there's, I feel like there's like two beliefs in that area. Um, so, but so we don't, since we don't put the dura back in, we just take it out and we put the plate on. We don't get that follow up because that area is now covered. Um, and if you want to go back in there and take a plate out, which we had to do once, you'll never ever do again. It's there's actually scar tissue, even though the plate's there, there's still a lot of scar tissue there. Um, but I think the information may be somewhat helpful for human surgeons as far as trying to make that distinction whether you do a duroplasty or not. Um, so I think that argument's still ongoing. I don't think anyone's really come up with a consensus, but it was a, I know it was a discussion and it, it still seems to be one. Now I'll go to this question. Um, this is also something that uh, is relevant in humans, so I'm curious if it is in dogs. Um, in treating stringomyelia, is de decompression surgery normally done first and then a shunt's placed if it's not effective, or do you just place the shunt? We rarely do a shunt. Okay. Um, almost all of them are just decompressed um, with the cranioplasty, and then we do follow them out, but most of the time, even if the syrinx doesn't completely resolve, there's enough um, change at the foramen magnum where the spinal fluid is going down a more normal, going around and more normal route. So even if that doesn't collapse down, they're clinically improved. Um, and for animals, you know, it, it's nice to have that MRI with the syrinx smaller or gone. We don't always get that, but what we're really looking for is what the owner cares about is the dog's quality of life. So um, that's that's why when our studies, that was more the focus is what is the, the owner's perception of the dog's quality of life. We did put in the information about C 
Searing's resolution. Um, that's we're actually still collecting the data on the actual Searing's volumes. Um, but we did find that the majority had improved okay. and some of them had resolved. Yeah, I guess my I, my question was going to be, did you see any cases where the symptoms got better, but the Searing's got worse? And I don't know if that's necessarily true. Or um, the thing of it is, is some the Searing's is not just specific to Chiari. So some of the reasons why their Searing's might not get better may not even be related to that because they can have some of these breeds have uh, herniated discs, some that are surgical and some that aren't, but compression from a herniated disc can cause a syrinx as well. So sometimes we may not get that great of resolution because the syrinx was there for more than one reason. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and, and if we believe a shunt would help, we would put one in, but most of the time these guys are, and it may be because they walk, you know, on four legs and the pressure on their spinal cords different. Um, that they tend to do better. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, on the topic of syrinx, can animals get traumatic syrinx like humans, or is it strictly? Um, I guess you kind of just answered that yeah. by. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, so syrinx is our our. Um, and sometimes I have to explain this, especially to cavalier owners, because they think SM is its own disease, which. In the majority of cases, it's not. Um, in the majority of cases, it is a secondary problem. Could it be a primary? Sure, of course, um, but very rare. So most of these dogs have a malformation at the back of their skull that's pushing on the brain that's causing the spinal fluid to go down the central canal. But you can have a brain tumor that can cause this, uh, or a spinal tumor. Um, they can get cysts. So any kind of disruption to the normal um, production and flow of the spinal fluid can cause a searing. Um, so that may be something that you can easily see sometimes, you know, especially if we're talking about, um, you know, at the frame and magnum, which there's, even in people they are talking about adhesions and veils of tissue that may be also causing a problem with the spinal fluid coming out. Um, those you can't really see on an MRI. Um, you have to kind of get down in there and have a magnifier, mm -hmm. um, to see that at the time of the surgery. Um, I almost forgot to ask this. You said something interesting during your presentation about how you had spayed, I think it was the, the German Shepherd, and oh, you yeah. saw some resolution in symptoms. So I, I was just curious because I know Dr. Klinga had mentioned something about um, pregnancy and different hormones kind of impacting how tethered cord was presenting in females. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering if neutering and spaying often Im like improves symptoms before you have to necessarily do any kind of decompression or something like that. Yeah, and honestly, like mo a lot of her, I mean, she still had a few of her urinary signs after being spayed, but a lot of them went away. So yeah, certainly could, if, if the only sign you have is that and you take away the hormone response and, and the other signs, I mean, again, you're talking about animals that can't talk. So maybe they are living with some level of discomfort and, you know, with their tail or their spine that you can't detect um, and they just live with it. Certainly you could spay them and they'd be happy and fine and you wouldn't notice any, you know, as the owner, sometimes they don't notice that their tail's not all the way up or whatever. They just think, oh, it's just the way my dog is. Um, yeah. And they really have, and I think that's why it's probably underdiagnosed too. Really interesting. Okay. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask that because I, I thought that was really a strange parallel, so maybe there is something to that for sure. Um, I did want to ask because, oh, hang on, there's a chat. Uh, oh no, yes, yes, you can listen to this after. <laughs> um, the, it will be recorded. <laughs> um, but so I wanted to ask you how many surgeries you've done, so of the Chiari or Syringomyelia, and is there an average number that a veterinary either surgeon or I guess you were trying to explain that it's a neurologist surgeon <laughs> um, how many should they have done to for someone to have confidence that their dog's gonna be okay I mean that we do this with uh, human patients all the time people are really nervous and they want to know that they're seeing an actual expert who can really help yeah. so I don't know if there's like yeah. a number or <laughs> I mean, we've probably done, I don't know, three, 400 of them, maybe more. I don't even know. I've lost count. Um, 
but I do get asked just because I, I don't just do neurosurgery. I do all kinds of surgery. So I get asked that all the time. Like, how many have you done? And I'm like, you know, we're talking about a cruciate. I do like three a day. I've done thousands. <laughs> like I can do them in my sleep. Um, you know, so I, I do get that question a lot. Um, and, and some of the people that come here as a second or third opinion also are coming here because the question they asked is how many surgeries have you done? And the answer may be two or three or five. And they're like, yeah, no, you're not touching my dog. <laughs> so, um, but even in human medicine, I think that makes a huge difference. If it's something that you've done a lot of, um, you know, you're comfortable with it, you've seen some complications, you know how to handle it. And also, uh, you know, I kind of feel that keeping your surgery time down, um, it, it may not be as big a deal in human medicine, but for animals, especially when you have to have owners who have to be compliant and give the antibiotics and the pain meds and everything, um, we do want to keep the infection rates down as well. So the longer you're doing surgery, the infection rate goes up. So, um, you know, that's another thing that you just kind of want is, is yes, yeah, certain surgeries take whatever they need to take. If you have someone who's inexperienced, it's going to take longer. Uh, about how long does the surgery take, I guess, is a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> Generally. Um, well, yeah, because Dr. Marino and I do these together, so we have a system. So we can do the whole surgery in probably less than an hour. Um, it probably takes them almost longer to prep the animal and get it set up than it does for us to do the procedure. So, um, again, you know, when we first started doing them, they they probably took us maybe an hour and a half or so. If we had a lot of bleeding, it might have taken longer. Um, but um, some of these dogs actually don't have a lot of bone back there either. So it's pretty quick to get in there. So um, these little Yorkies, they're like four or five pounds to begin with. They're really teeny tiny. And if they have bone missing at the back of their skull and their compression is from soft tissue, well, that's, half, that's a big part of the surgery there. You're not even removing bone. It's not even existent. Um, so that can make it go quicker. But we also have to remember if they're four pounds, the longer they're under anesthesia, you have to really maintain their temperatures and things like that. So you don't want to be keeping them out too long um, for their own anesthetic health. Yeah, that's a good point. It's so crazy how different it is for different breeds, but I guess it makes sense. But yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, and you got to think like, uh, you know, and they're different sizes too, you know, Cavaliers tend to be 20 pounds, most of them, some of them are smaller, some of them are bigger, um, but Yorkies are usually like five, 10 pounds, um, Chihuahuas are tiny, but they got these big dome heads. So all, a lot of breeds have breed differences. And that's something else you kind of have to know if you haven't done a lot of these surgeries is you go, go down there and you're expecting bone to be there. And I know in certain breeds, it's not going to be there. And if you're going down and expecting bone and you're poking around and you're starting to poke at the back of the you know, brain, that's not a good thing. So, you, you know, when I'm teaching residents and everything and they're scrubbed in, I do warn them. I'm like, you can't just willy nilly go back down here. You've got to be very careful. You got to, you know, make sure that there's bone there. It's not soft tissue. If it is soft tissue, you've got to be very careful in clearing the muscle and everything from those areas um, so that you don't create a problem. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, there was an interesting question that about actually COVID um, and pets. So obviously this has been a big deal for the past year and a half. Um, but have you seen any animals or I guess animals in general, but dogs, I guess, with COVID-19? I know originally there was a concern um, that even the CDC had put out there that they might act as vectors and maybe don't get so close if you get infected. Um, I think that initial concern's kind of blown over, but I'm just curious about like the experience that lives regarding COVID and animals, if there is any at all. Yeah, I mean, so we did find that they could be carriers in the fact that they could carry it on their fur. So during the height of COVID, you know, unfortunately we still don't have owners coming in the building. They're still out in their cars. Um, but all the animals get wiped down with alcohol uh, wipes because they could carry the virus on their fur. And then, you know, we don't have, we don't have gloves on. We're like, oh, hi, and, and, you know, petting the dog and then you touch your face. <laughs> it's the same thing. So that was probably a bigger concern is just, um, you know, coming in on their fur and things like that. 
but most of them actually having like clinical COVID. It was pretty rare. I think there were a couple dogs in the entire country that they had proven that had had it. Um, some cats, uh, I think the tiger, uh, they had a tiger at the Bronx Zoo that they found that had it. I mean, they get coronavirus. I mean, coronavirus is out in the environment. There are multiple different versions of it. And so this is this COVID-19 was a very new one that no one had been exposed to, but animals also have their own coronavirus that they um, are exposed to. That, and then most people, if you're vaccinating your pet, you're, one of the vaccines in there is a coronavirus. Um, so they don't always cross species. Now, mutants, could some of these mutants cross species? We don't know yet. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. That's, I didn't think about it on their fur. That's. Everything. I didn't think about that either, but Dr. Marino had <laughs> just like had this whole protocol and we're like, what? And he goes, no, it could come in on the fur. And we, we do a lot of work with Stony Brook. Um, they actually had our ventilator for a while. Um, so he was in close contact with the doctors there. And so they were also, besides getting stuff from the CDC and from the state, um, we were getting some medical information directly just to try to keep every you know we have over 150 employees here um and and we're also under construction so we're in a smaller <laughs> than normal area right now and so we're just trying to keep all our employees safe as well and uh so we were doing everything we could to minimize contact yeah i have to tell you um just as a credit to lives uh, and i told this to mary actually um when this all started breaking some of like the best public health information that I saw was coming out of lives. And I, I remember I shared it and I was like, this is the best explanation of this virus that I've seen yet. And like, I'd seen it from really big places, like including like the CDC and stuff like that. But like, it was explained so well. So it was just a real credit to whoever was on your social media at the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll let the hospital minister you know, cause he, I mean, he, he was really, um, Poor man, keeping up with all out of it, and you know the, you know we with with employees, you have HIPAA laws that you have to uh, adhere to, and so he was really trying hard to keep everyone safe and let people know when they needed to know and things like that. So I mean, and we you know just like any business, we got employees that had COVID. I I had it for a period of time. Um, thank God we've all recovered from it, um, and right now everyone's getting vaccinated. So you know. Even though we're an animal hospital, it's still made up of people um, between the people who work here and the clients. So um, we're just trying to keep everyone safe. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So going back to Kiari a little bit. So has anyone ever done measurements of the shape or like the size of the cranium in dogs? There's yes, a theory there are. That, ooh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, there are there are actually some papers out there that you can um, you can get. Um, I think most of them were out of the uh, North Carolina state. Um, they did uh, measurements on skulls and CTs. Uh, Dr. Rusbridge out of um, the UK, she's done a lot of those types of studies as well. Um, uh, so they're different. And, and they also broke it down by breeds. I think um, Dr. Rusbridge has done some, uh, you know, Brussels, Griffon uh, measurements, and some have done and compared them like Labradors and, um, other brachycephalic dogs, because um, one of the things with Cavaliers is they, if you look uh, at the King Charles Spaniel, it has a longer nose, and somewhere along the line there in, in the UK, they decided that they wanted to shorten the nose, so they bred those dogs, and this is like 100 years ago, um, but they bred them with pugs, <laughs> and they think when they did that, that's how they created this problem, because if you look at a pug, it's got this big dome-shaped head and this short nose, um, so um, they think that's kind of where it came from in that particular dog. But if you look at some of these other ones, like Dorkies have dome heads and so, yeah. So the and, information um, there. Were they able to, do you know if there's any difference between, I, I know it, some 80% of King Charles have uh, Chiari or something like it, um, but are there uh, King Charles that have been uh, scanned that don't have Chiari symptoms and is there any differences between them like volumetrically? Um, there are I mean because we MRI dogs for other problems and and uh, Cavaliers also can have herniated discs 
Um, I don't see it that often though. And, and, and probably we do have a skewed population because we do the surgery here. Um, those are the cases you, we tend to get. But yeah, I have a few that I treat for other problems that don't have PR. Um, I want to end with a couple of different questions. So, but first I wanted to just ask you, I know you're doing a lot of research. Um, what do you think is probably the most important research that's probably coming down the pipe for Chiari in dogs or Syrinx in dogs in the next like five to 10 years, maybe? What, well, what do you think we can learn? Yeah, we're still arguing in veterinary medicine um, whether you should do medical versus surgical management. We don't even have a consensus on that. Um, our research has been delayed. It, it seems like every time we're ready to publish it, then they want more information and more information. Um, so we had tried to publish it and they wanted um, the syrinx volumes in that paper, which we had not planned for that version of the paper. We had actually plan to do it as a separate thing. Um, so then they won't publish it without. So now we're like getting all, this, trying to get all the syrinx measurements, which is a lot because like I said, the MR and after, and it's six months, one year, five years. So every Frank dog needs to have the volume measurements done and redone and redone and redone. So, um, it's kind of delayed that particular paper. So that'll be a big thing because no one else has that many cases. I think mm -hmm. in that particular paper is like 126 dogs with long-term follow-up. So long-term is more than a year in, in dogs. Um, most of the other carry papers are much smaller. Um, so I think we'll probably start seeing a little more about why surgery is better. I'm, I'm hoping like some other people who maybe do different types of decompressions will have larger numbers as well because anything we can do to put it out there that it does improve the quality of life and it is a viable option I mean sometimes people can't afford it you know because you know not everyone has insurance and unfortunately it's considered congenital so insurance doesn't always cover it either so it's the same problem in animals as in people if you have a pre-existing or congenital condition sometimes they'll not cover it so it's not a cheap procedure either yeah that's interesting. I didn't even think of that. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think I just, I'm curious. I don't know if there's any way that you would know this, but do you know like what proportion of the Chiari dogs that you see might also have some sort of EDS or some other related disorder? Is there a lot that's going on comorbid in dogs or is it really more of a thing <laughs> no no there there are um eds just is not something that and, and again it may be something else that's underdiagnosed because i certainly see lots of dogs with skin that like <laughs> but i don't ever think to measure it um and unless they're having a problem i wouldn't even bother um tether cord as i said we probably see more of it than we diagnose um Certainly with the Chiari dogs, because we're MRIing their whole body, we certainly can find other problems. Um, so probably one of the most common things we find in conjunction is a herniated disc. Um, so if they're kind of mild and chronic discs, they don't necessarily need surgery. They just need to be monitored. But sometimes we'll actually do Chiari surgery with the spinal surgery at the same time because, you know, you can't always predict like, how much is the Chiari contributing to what's going on, how much is the herniated disc. Um, but certainly they all have like, you know, the Cavaliers have the heart disease. Um, I, some of them actually do have allergies. Um, so I've, I've had to be a dermatologist at times as well as a surgeon and a neurosurgeon and, um, also seizure management too sometimes, um, just because the surgery doesn't always stop the seizures. So we do end up doing a lot of other comorbid problems. Um, not always neurologic though. Interesting. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm still thinking about the the pilosec and <laughs> the GI issue and the well. That's, I, but that's how it happens in medicine. Sometimes it's sometimes it's something. You. This is how you find out that these medications work. Is you're using it for something else, and it helps with another problem. Yeah. So, <laughs> and and you know, it, there's going to be research coming down the pike that's going to eventually figure out the exact mechanism because it's 
you know, it's it's meant to work on receptors in the stomach. So how does it work at CSF production? So, um, you know, somebody will figure that out. Um, there's another, um, and they were supposed to do the study at Cornell, but I don't think it ever happened. Um, one of the medications we use for dogs for nausea um, supposedly works into pain uh, at specific um, substance P receptors and uh, you know it's meant for vomiting yeah that's that so weird. pain so <laughs> huh. it's one of those things yeah all right well ooh, I'm kicking my table um so I think we can stop because I don't want to keep up your too much of your time you're still at work so um <laughs> I do want to ask so if people want to get in touch with you or um maybe if they're having dogs who are having issues like how do they get to talk to you guys how do they see so actually if you go to the hospital website you can send an email um and so there's somebody that checks them so every once in a while i'll you know people have a specific question it'll it'll get sent to my mailbox but since we have other specialists so like you know some people have eye questions and things like that that'll end up going through the up the ophthalmologist so you can actually get pretty far on the website awesome Perfect. So I'll include that in the notes for the video and this is all said and done. But with that, I just wanted to thank you so much for doing this, Dr. Catherine Lowen, not Dr. Kevin Barber. <laughs> but um, this was great. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. Very, I'm going to thank Dr. Kevin Barber for having his computer here because I was, I was intending to go home and use my personal computer, but it did not happen. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kevin Barber. <laughs> and ironically, none of our computers here have cameras on them. Oh, I don't really? know. <laughs> yeah, that's why I couldn't use my, um, yeah, for meetings <laughs> and stuff, I have to usually use my phone, which I didn't think was a yeah. <laughs> good for to give a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, no worries. But uh, all right, so thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, I know there are a couple of other questions that I think you and Dr. Marino were going to address later but uh, yeah um, there was an email that had some yeah. really great <laughs> questions um so i did send it to i did forward it to dr e, uh, marino um so hopefully in the next week or two we'll, we can craft an email back to awesome perfect thank you and okay thank you for joining <laughs> all right thanks